Many cases throughout history will go unsolved, but sometimes the authorities and families catch a break and suddenly they have a suspect. Today, we're digging back into the past to look at some strange and scary stories. There are five cold cases from the 80s finally solved. And number five, Risa Trexler. It's been 36 years since Risa Trexler's horrific murder. After a strenuous investigation, the case went cold for three and a half decades. And only recently, with the use of DNA and genetic genealogy, investigators were able to shed light on who killed the young girl. Back on June 15th of 1984, a gruesome scene unfolded in North Carolina. 15-year-old Risa was found in her bedroom at her grandparents' house. She had been stabbed multiple times. Some of the blows were so violent that her spinal cord had been completely severed. The steel blade was still lodged in Trexler's right shoulder, but left behind was the DNA from the killer after he had assaulted her. But back then, DNA wasn't a huge factor in solving a lot of crimes. The initial investigations went nowhere, and so for over three decades, the case just sat cold. Rumors were rampant around the small town of Salisbury about who could have committed such a gruesome act. Some even said that Trexler's sister, who was 13 years old at the time, was the culprit. She would go on to appear on the Dr. Phil show in 2018 to take a polygraph test to prove her innocence. That appearance sparked new interest in the case. According to Sergeant Travis Schellenberger from the Salisbury PD, detectives went back and reviewed the evidence, conducted interviews, and collected DNA samples to try to solve this seemingly impossible case. With the use of genetic genealogy, detectives were actually able to find and match the DNA left behind in Trexler's body. And so now the authorities were able to determine who the prime suspect was. He was a man in his 40s during the time of the crime, but according to police, the unnamed suspect died in 2004. Lieutenant Greg Beam said they are not releasing the name of the suspect, as he has no means of defending himself in the court of law. However, after exhuming his body, they were able to match his DNA to that found at the crime scene, and so it's with 100% certainty that he did in fact commit the murder. At first, police speculated that Trexler's killer could have been a family member. They didn't understand how such a violent act could have occurred by a random stranger, but they turned out to be wrong. While police never confirmed or denied the name of the suspect, the most probable man was named Curtis Blair, as per the court warrant. Blair had a long criminal history, including assault with a deadly weapon, and witnesses claimed they saw a man that closely matched the description of Blair, fleeing from the crime scene at the time of the homicide. He was the same age as the perpetrator would have been. Based on genetic, genealogical, and circumstantial evidence, Blair was a very strong candidate, plus... He died in 2004. As of today, the police have closed the case. No charges were filed after the investigation and Trexler's sister was officially able to clear her name. Although, anyone who looks into the case, even just a little bit, would know there was no way it could have been the girl. In a small town, when something so horrific happens, people get to talking. Number four. Kathleen Flynn. Kathleen Flynn was walking home from Ponus Ridge Middle School in Norwalk, Connecticut on September 28th of 1986, but she never made it. Worried when she hadn't come home at her usual time, her mother reported her missing. The following day, Kathleen's partially clothed body was found in the woods, 158 feet from the pathway that she took each day along Hunter's Lane. The autopsy revealed that Kathleen died of asphyxia due to ligature strangulation. Ligature marks were visible around her wrists and neck, indicating that the 11-year-old was bound and strangled with some sort of rope or cord. Norwalk Police Chief at the time, Carl LaBianca, and the entire department became consumed with solving this case. 
Norwalk is not the type of town to encounter such a vicious crime, and while they accumulated mounds of evidence, conducted hundreds of interviews, and had suspects, nothing solid ever came from it, and so the case ran cold for more than 30 years. One of the first suspects in Kathleen's case was a man named Mark Curran. Curran was accused of sexual assault in early 1986. He raised suspicions because his charges involved eerily similar characteristics of Kathleen's murder. While interviewed by Norwalk police, Curran then admitted that he visited the school to see some teachers and the librarian around the time of the murder. But on the exact day of the 23rd, he maintained that he was walking around Connecticut Avenue looking for a job. Also, investigators noted that he was very nervous and apprehensive and smoked three cigarettes during the brief interview. Karan added that he did not know Kathleen and was innocent, but he could not provide an alibi the afternoon she disappeared. Investigators collected hair samples from the man following his first arrest in January of 86. And after comparing these to evidence found on Kathleen, authorities could not find a direct match. And this is mainly because those tests were not as foolproof as what we have today. And during the two years after Kathleen's murder, numerous hair samples from potential suspects were tested, but none of them matched. Frustrated investigators felt as if they had run into dead ends. Karam would go on to be implicated on multiple charges after the murder of Kathleen, and these included an abduction, an attempted kidnapping, and at least two cases of assault. He was eventually sentenced to 10 years in prison for his continuous offenses between 86 and 88. At the beginning of 1999, evidence relating to Kathleen's murder was re-examined using newer forensic and genetic technologies. It was an extremely slow and painstaking process, according to investigators. During this time, older and smaller pieces of evidence ruled out earlier suspects. The case was then transferred from the Norwalk Police Cold Case Unit and assigned to Lieutenant Art Weisgerber. Weisgerber initiated the reinvestigation of Karan and obtained warrants for the reexamination of his hair samples. In 2010, Kathleen's clothes and fingernail scrapings were tested for touch DNA. By 2017, a warrant was issued to Karan, who had been released for serving his time and living in Maine he was to submit new samples and DNA swabs. By this time, it had been more than 30 years since the murder. But investigators had not given up. The results came back and it indicated that Karun could not be eliminated as the source of the DNA and Kathleen's fingernail scrapings, meaning it was likely him who committed the crime. With all the tests, evidence, and previous crimes mounted against Karun, he was eventually arrested. Robert Fabrizio, the Norwalk Detective Bureau Commander at the time of Kathleen's murder, expressed how exhausting the investigation was, but that his team persevered even after three decades. He added, With technology, things just show up. I'm amazed, but I'm really glad there's some closure for the family. Number 3. Adam Walsh It's every parent's nightmare to lose a child. This nightmare turned into a reality for John and Reevy Walsh when their son Adam was kidnapped on July 27, 1981. The six-year-old had accompanied his mother to a department store at the Hollywood Mall in Hollywood, Florida. As Reevy was shopping, Adam stayed at a kiosk where other children were taking turns playing video games. At around 12.15 p.m., Reevy returned to the kiosk, only to find that Adam and the other boys had disappeared. According to a store manager that she talked to, there was a dispute over whose turn it was to play the games, at which time the security guard told all the kids to leave the store unless their parents were there. According to his parents, Adam must have been too shy to explain to the security guard that he was waiting for his mother, so he just followed the other children. Reevy had paged for her son continuously over the public address system and looked for him throughout the entire store. After more than 90 minutes of searching, she called the Hollywood police at 1.55 p.m. 
Over the next few weeks, Adam's parents pleaded on TV, and search parties looked everywhere. They were desperate, and the family offered up a $100,000 reward for anyone who could guarantee his return. The family's worst nightmare, though, was realized on August 10th, when detectives found the head of a child in a drainage canal alongside the Florida Turnpike. It was Adam. According to a coroner, the six-year-old's death was caused by asphyxiation. Judging by the state of the remains, it was most likely that he had died several days before the officers made the discovery. To this day, the rest of his body has never been found. Otis Toole, a convicted serial killer, would go on to confess that he was the murderer. In his confession, he lured Adam into his 1971 Cadillac, promising candy and toys. Initially compliant, the young boy started to panic as he was being taken away from the department store. Tool then punched him in the face, driving him unconscious. After realizing that he was still alive and breathing, Tool then killed him with a machete. He claimed that his motive was actually to adopt Adam. During the investigation, the police had lost the bloodstained carpet from Tool's car, the machete, and eventually the car itself. Tool had repeatedly confessed to the abduction and murder of Adam, but then he retracted all of his confessions and claimed he had no involvement. On September 15th of 1996, Tool died from liver cirrhosis in prison. He was never charged for the murder, but he was serving a life sentence for the other crimes he committed. However, Hollywood Police Chief Rick Stone says that beyond a reasonable doubt, Tool was Adam's killer. While no new evidence has been presented, Adam's case was closed on December 16th of 2008. The police announced they were satisfied that Tool had done the deed. Number 2. Marcy Belex A gruesome case of the assault and murder of a 12-year-old girl in 1985 had gone cold for 35 years. On March 25th of 2020, Spokane Police announced that investigators had solved the case with the help of DNA analysis technology. According to police, Marcy Belex ran away from her home on August 2nd, 1985. Two days later, her body was found in an impound yard. The autopsy revealed that she was assaulted and then stabbed a total of 31 times. Upon further test, she was killed at the exact location where her body was and she had no defensive wounds. Investigators pinpointed 87 possible suspects. Sadly though, without hard proof, the case went cold. In recent years, a Virginia DNA technology company though obtained a DNA sample from the crime scene. They submitted it to a genetic database for comparison hoping to find someone who might match the possible suspect. After these tests, police were able to link the DNA found at the crime scene to Clayton Gies. He was 22 years old at the time of Belex's assault and murder and was living in Spokane. His record showed that he had a very minor criminal background and was arrested once for marijuana possession. Investigators reached a dead end when they discovered Gaze had died in a car crash in Spokane Valley in January of 89. Authorities requested that Gaze's remains be exhumed to run further tests and his family willingly complied. And police were able to confirm that his DNA was a match to the samples found at the 85 crime scene. In fact, it was one of the closest DNA matches investigators had ever come across. This revelation brought relief to Belex's parents and four sisters. As stated by Captain Brad Erleth, justice in this case, maybe not, the guy's deceased. But closure, I think, for the family, for the community, and for the people who remember that. Number one, British Columbia couple. After more than 30 years since it happened, a 55-year-old Seattle-area man has been arrested for the double homicide of a young Canadian couple murdered in Washington. Thanks to the sophisticated DNA tests of today, 
William Earl Talbot II was taken into custody after his DNA matched the samples collected from the crime scene. And 20-year-old Jay Cook and 18-year-old Tanya Van Kulenberg, both from Sinek, British Columbia, were last seen on November 18, 1987. Tiny's body was the first to be located on November 25th. The autopsy revealed that she had been assaulted, tied up, and shot in the head. The first investigator suspected that Jay was responsible, but two days later, his body was discovered 60 miles from where Tanya's was. He had been beaten with rocks and strangled. There were multiple public appeals, but detectives were unable to get viable leads. It wasn't until April 11, 2018 that a new technique, snapshot DNA phenotyping, helped create a composite sketch of the suspect. Additionally, a forensic laboratory uploaded his DNA to public genealogy databases. After matching with some of Talbot's great-grandparents, investigators identified the 55-year-old as the prime suspect. They confirmed their suspicions by obtaining a DNA sample from a paper cup he had discarded in the trash, and he was an exact match. Talbot, who was 24 years old at the time of the murders, was found guilty in June of 2019 on two counts of aggravated first-degree murder and sentenced to two life sentences of life in prison without parole. For the last 20 years, he worked as a truck driver and had no criminal history. Laura Banstra, Jay's sister, told the press that while it was a painful 31 years since the horrific murders, the arrest brought their families relief, joy, and great sorrow. So there were five cold cases from the 80s finally solved. It can be utterly heartbreaking for a victim's family if their case goes cold. Thankfully, though, Technology and unyielding investigators give the families hope and, more importantly, closure. If you enjoyed this, please like and subscribe and please check out more of our content. You can join us on Patreon for exclusive videos and an exclusive library with a wide range of strange unsolved mysteries, things like a trunk that was found dumped in a park that had a body stuffed in it, and the disappearance of Randy Leach from a party. There's a bunch of others, so check it out. Thank you very much for tuning in. I'll see you soon.